great morning to be here, folks. <coughs> um, ChatGPT launched uh, around end of last year, and uh, I think all of us went through waves of curiosity, skepticism, and even resistance, right? Like a whole bunch of creative agencies I heard were banning ChatGPT as well. And then I think we've come to a point of embracing ChatGPT and or open AI and, and, and if, if not really using it fully, uh, definitely sort of come to a stage of acceptance. I opened up uh, using, I mean, I sort of mandated use of open AI uh, with, with, uh, with DVO. Um, and, and that was obviously more from a creative and production standpoint. But um, interestingly, it was at the backdrop of my HR rejecting candidates who were using ChatGPT to, um, you know, to sort of recruit candidates. It's like, hey, look, to chat GPT use kar rahe hai, answer karne ke liye, to, you know, we're, we're not accepting them. So, um, but, you know, it's, 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 it's sort of in a, in a way con confused. We are going through a behavioral change, um, you know, as, as humanity, uh, where <clears throat> the way we look at education, the way we look at evaluation, everything will need to change, right? So, uh, and, and therefore, you know, the very pertinent question to answer here is that what is the most important skill set uh, that will be relevant in the coming time, even with the talent that we're recruiting um, as marketers, as agencies, as brands, or uh, you know, irrespective of the industry. And a talent that we are really looking for is what we call as prompt engineering. So prompt engineering is, um, is nothing but the ability to interact with the AI tools and bring out the best output from the AI tools, right? So therefore, um, every young talent out there, uh, really all they need to do is deep dive into the world of AI tools that there is. I think there are about a thousand of them that are launching every week as we speak. And this is, most of you would have seen, the, the latest sort of um, update on tools, you know, the best tools uh, which are working across creativity, productivity, video, writing, so on and so forth, right? Um, so if we sort of just step back for a bit um, and, and look at what's really happening um, at the level of humanity, society, and commerce. I think it's best explained by the way uh, Tim Urban um, articulates it, where he says, the human colossus refers to the collective intelligence and capabilities of the entire human population working together. He suggests that while individual human intelligence is limited, the combination of human minds collaborating effectively can achieve remarkable feats. It's mind-boggling. It's excitingly scary as well, right? I mean, imagine every way of thinking, um, every analysis that is there out there in the market. Um, you know, it's literally 7 billion ways of thinking available to you at the click of a button, right? If you know the right prompt, you have seven billion ways, potentially, of ways of thinking that is available to you at the click of a button. So, and, and, and just because of, of this sort of a transition uh, that, that we are looking at, human progress, if you saw that this was sort of almost like a, uh, you know, a soft curve, you're standing right there, and what you're going to see is this curve, right? Hockey stick or whatever stick that is, right? So it's, um, so this, in a sense, so imagine this, right? I mean, essentially what's happened so far is we may, maybe as a human race, we just got stuck in the mundane, in the routine, um, in things that took away a lot of our time, and, and suddenly uh, we have opened up to a whole new environment where uh, you're going to explore human potential like we've never done before. I mean, um, you guys have seen the movie Lucy? Yeah? So it's very interesting. A few years ago, though, where they said maybe as human beings we're using only 5% of our actual brain capacity. And with, with AI, we are opening up the 95% that we can, you know, we can, we can actually access. So, um, yeah, and obviously AI and machine learning has sort of been around for a while now, but what really happened is that it became usable. You know, it, uh, it had a user interface which didn't require coding knowledge for all of us to access the power of AI, right? So that's really what happened with OpenAI. So the question 
that we are answering, and I think Harshil also spoke about, is that are we going to lose jobs? But here's a way to think about it. Like, let's look at history. Um, because we learned to drive cars, it didn't make walking obsolete, right? Because we learned to fly planes, it didn't make even driving cars obsolete. All that really happened is we were able to get to where we want to be faster. In fact, I was reading only yesterday that the advent of machines is actually what introduced what they call as a five-day week. Right? So advent of machines actually what brought in a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and take a break on Saturday and Sunday. So, so in a sense, what we will see is obviously amount of time that we reduce to do what we actually do. Um, but <coughs> the access that AI is going to allow uh, all of us is what is very phenomenal, right? Uh, by which I mean, what do I mean by access? You may have um, the best story to tell, okay? But you may not be the best writer. But the person who has the best story to tell is going to win today. You may have the best idea for a product because your ability to observe the human condition gives you the insight to develop the best product, but you may not have the resources to build this product, or you may not have the coding knowledge to build this product, right? With AI, you won't need it. The best idea, the product idea wins, right? So in, in some sense, I look, I look at AI as, as an equalizer, right? So I think finally entering an equal uh, society, and that is what is most exciting about where we are going. And the reason I'm setting this context is I'm going to segue into what it's going to mean for, for brands, the future of brands, right? Um, <coughs> this is known. Essentially, we can process a large amount of data. We have patterns which otherwise human beings cannot see. So all of this is known. What it can do, what it can't do, I think this room is fairly familiar with. Um, now let's sort of segue into looking at what is possible now that wasn't before, right? Um, Dwell on this. We are brands ourselves as independent agencies, and we work with brands. Are we a product business, or are we a platform business? Right? So what is a product business? A product business is a business model that creates value by delivering products and services down the supply chain. I mean, largely, I think if you look at even our businesses, that's what we're doing, right? We're running, a, in some sense, a service and product business works the same way. Supply chain logistics at work here. Whereas platform business is a business model that creates value by building and tapping into network effects. So which is supply side, demand side. Homestays, Airbnbs. Hotel rooms, booking.com. Content creators network, Netflix and its audience, right? So in essence, what's happening is with AI, platform businesses will scale and get value like never before. Uh, the reason for that is with every interaction on a platform, you're learning about your consumer and you have access to what you call as information arbitrage, right? I'm, I'm actually currently studying at the Harvard Business School and among all the case studies that I have deep dived into, there's one thing that stands out like nothing else, which is businesses that have access to first party data. Yeah, first party, first hand consumer information are the ones that are widely winning today, right? So if you look at your own business as a platform business and imagine what it could do for your business, um, I think they have a huge chance of winning over there, right? So um, the other thing to look at is, I mean, as brands and the brands that we're working with, uh, human interaction with software, right? Now, that's also going to define how uh, customers will dis discover the brands uh, that we work with. Now, in a, in a scenario, imagine a scenario where 
your fridge uh, is telling you that you are low on milk in the fridge and, and that you should place an order and asks you for a yes or no command but also specifies to you the brand of the milk that you should buy, right? So, so that's sort of how the discovery of brands is likely to happen um, in the coming days. And, and the other interesting um, trend is, as mentioned by Greg Brockman, um, we are used to interacting with apps like if I want to uh, order in for food, then I go to Zomato, if I, you know, grocery, Blinkit, and you know, so on and so forth. But you're talking about, with AI, a single interface that can do all of this for you. So it's fundamentally going to change the way we even engage with software. It's going to be nothing like what we've done before, right? Now, for us to be able to enable all of this, what do brands need to do, right? For lack of a better word, I'm calling it compliance. Is your brand AI compliant? Which means what? Foundation of being able to use AI is data, right? So as businesses and brands, are you structuring your data in a way that your business is queryable, right? So do you have a query engine for your own business? Is your data organized in a way that your business is queryable? And why do we need to start doing that for our brands today? It's because only that will allow us to collaborate and be compatible with other applications, right? So in some sense, SEO compliance will also be a thing of past. It's about AI compliance. Yeah, is your data structured in a way that it can interact with other applications? But there are challenges, yeah? Uh, but again, since we'll be sort of leading this, uh, these models of AI in marketing, I think one thing to be mindful of is that the more the machine learns about an archetype, the more the machine learns about the target audience, uh, the more likely it is to recommend only certain kind of brands and businesses to you, right? So that's gonna limit discovery of new businesses and brands. What happens to startups? What happens to equal competition, right? So therefore, I think one of the things to keep in mind is, um, you know, while we're developing some of these, these tools uh, and working on them, there has to be a, founda the foundation models need to take care of the brand discovery without bias. And um, moving on to another trend that we need to be watchful, wa watchful of is, I mean, it's not about watchful, it's just something that we should move towards and uh, start strategizing, thinking for our brands for is uh, ESV, right? So um, your brand's pricing, placement, and positioning, all these three things are going to depend on the carbon footprint that your brand is leaving behind, right? And, and that's, um, and, and this, I, you know, over the next couple of years is going to fundamentally change um, how even customers uh, look at look at brands, right? So technology to, so, so uh, we've got to advise our businesses and brands to start having tech which can measure carbon footprint for their business. Now let's pause and think about um, how do we sort of make sense of all of this as on today. Um, <coughs> while we spoke at length about, you know, uh, about AI, I think the more important thing to do would be to start training AI on the culture of your company. Like, can you train the platforms on the voice of your company? Can you train, or the brands that you're working with, right? Can you train AI, for example, think about creating a mood board of images that echo the brand or the sentiment of your company, right? So this, in a sense, is the first step towards training AI to become more and more relevant. Um, now I'll show you a use case of how you can train and actually make this workable. Friend of mine, Aaron uh, from New York, is doing this actively right now, uh, where uh, on his tool Daydream, he's trained the machine on thousands and thousands of creative campaigns, okay? So in a sense, I can feed in a brief into the interface and it'll give me a YouTube idea, it'll give me an event uh, idea, it'll give me an Instagram idea, you know, and, and sort of be building in uh, more and more options over there. And, and now we're further taking this into Ad DVO training AI on our 15 years of data, right? So we've got like, I think, close to about 10,000 go-to-market presentations industry by industry, 
and we are working on training uh, the machines on our data, our strategy, in a way that imagine the amount of time and as a services business, right? I mean, you have new people who are coming in all the time. You know, you're sort of going through your own training cycles. You're going through your, uh, uh, you know, I mean, bringing in consistency with human resources is sort of the biggest challenge today, right? So imagine your GDM is sort of taken care of at a click of a button, or at least you have a model. The zero to one journey is done because we're training it on all the data and all the strategies and all the creators that we've worked on industry by industry so far. So that's that's DVO one. Um, so intelligence over the last many years sitting on it. So uh, indeed, we're going to see more changes in the next five years than we've seen in the last 50 years. And uh, while I spoke about AI and I spoke about you know ESG, uh, there are a bunch of other things that are making the noise, right? Like, I I, I think you know <laughs> if if we thought if you thought metaverse was a fact, um, let's just think again. Uh, what what really happened with with metaverse? What is metaverse? It's it's about essentially experiencing content in 3D environments, right? So it's a 2D to 3D shift. It's about experiencing content in 3D environments. Why we didn't see its full potential in ACT is because we don't have the infrastructure for it. The graphic cards are not ready. Yeah, the you know the hardware is not ready. But right from Microsoft to Apple, everybody, you, you guys know it, they're all working on that, right? So it's just a matter of time while the infrastructure gets, gets ready. Now, again, let's think about those of you who have five, six, seven, ten year olds at home. What are they doing the most? Playing games, right? And games are actually the, the most fundamental version of what we call as metaverse. So humanity over the next five or six years will start expressing itself on metaverse. And at some level, you know, when I look back at what Mark Zuckerberg did, you know, it had its, you know, people thought it was a fad, but he's not stupid to name his entire company Meta. Who will win in the near future is where the seven billion people actually land on metaverse. Okay, and he's hoping it could be potentially Facebook, right? So, and therefore, um, the thing to do for brands today. Uh, is to start working on 3D content, right? Like th that's a foundational block. You know, start visualizing your business or brand in 3D content. And with all of these sort of new uh, tech, as we call it, that's emerging, the most important thing to do for us is to this is this is my favorite exercise, right? Is to run what we call as the futures wheel. Yeah. So what does futures wheel do? Take a section of a business and and look at all the changes that are happening around us with tech, okay, it could be AI, it could be uh, 3D content, metaverse, uh, blockchain, I mean, that's the other thing, right? I mean, of course, there's conversations on crypto and NFT and so on and so forth, but think about it, right? NFT, uh, the biggest challenge that we have, okay, luxury industry, if you take it, is NFT is nothing but a contract sitting on top of a digital asset or a physical asset, right? It's a contract sitting on top of a digital or a physical asset. For the entire luxury industry, if you label your bag with an NFT, I can even track my secondary sales, right? So that, in essence, is the power of what NFT can do for brands. We have yet to go through all the regulatory frameworks and find like, you know, uh, something that can operationalize some of these things that we're talking about today. Uh, but just NFT as a technology, I'm saying, is, is can, can be a game changer. So in essence, just pause and look at where your business is, look at all the changes that are happening in the industry, and it's a consequence cycle, right? It's a consequence cycle. Look at what changes are likely to happen for your own business and the businesses of your clients, and start preparing for it today. Yeah, so that's what I have for you folks, and uh, I hope this was useful. Thank you so much.